Hello everyone, welcome back for some more um, business ethics video lectures. We're continuing our uh, ethical theory crash course tonight with Kant. Um, and uh, Kant's really tough to understand. Uh, he's, he's a bit of a challenge um, and I've studied him a lot and I have to say of all the, the lectures that I give um, in this class, I think the Kant lecture is always one of the ones that I'm most intimidated by. Um, it's one of the um, most challenging uh, theories to understand. Um, one of the fun anecdotes about Kant is that Kant says in his own writings that he thinks his moral theory is not something that is at a left field or coming from, from some goofy ideas he has or something, something esoteric or original. Uh, he's actually pretty adamant about how he uh, is not inventing this moral theory at all, and he's actually just giving a philosophical description, he says. This is the ironic part. Kant says, all he's doing is just philosophically describing what ordinary people think about morality. Not trained philosophers, not trained ethicists, not people who are like really deep into studying this stuff. Um, and I think that's hilarious because uh, one, his writing is definitely not the most accessible. Um, he, if you're, if you think like Kant, then it kind of makes sense. But most of us don't think like Kant. I always have a few students who are like, Kant was easy. All the other ones were harder. Um, and so if you're in that boat, enjoy it because <laughs> a lot of other people are not, um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, but I think it's, it's funny that, that Kant thinks that he's just describing what we ordinarily think, because I think when you hear it in the theoretical language that he uses and the theoretical models he provides, it might look really alien. It might look really different from how you normally think about moral reasoning. But I think it's not, it'd be too quick to dismiss Kant's claim here too. I think um, just out of hand is absurd. I, I think he, he has some grounds for thinking that what he's up to here is something that connects pretty deeply with how we normally morally reason and uh, what our moral intuitions tell us. Um, by the way, Kant, like Mill, is not going to be putting stock in his theory on intuitive grounds. He's actually maybe even more skeptical about intuitions than Mill is, and we'll talk about why. Um, but this one, uh, this is a, a buckle up, because uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on here and some pretty strange stuff too. Normally, I actually, um, when I'm teaching my ethical theory course, I usually spend a whole day, if not more, just giving students a background into Kant's general philosophical um, perspective and his methodology especially, um, because he is one of these really original thinkers, someone who who is coming like a throwing the table upside down, you know, kind of uh, throwing a big stone in the pond that makes for a big change in everyone's thinking, a paradigm shift, you might say. Um, he's he's a, he's a unique one. Um, I'm hard pressed to think of other philosophers from the history of Western philosophy that are quite as original um, and sort of thinking outside of the box than Kant. Um, so I, I'm not going to do all that with you here because uh, I want to kind of keep this a um, manageable video and, and move things along uh, as quickly as we can. Um, but I do want to give you some idea of where Kant's coming from and what motivates him. Um, one of the reasons why I usually spend all this time setting him up is that um, of all the theories, like I, I, I was complaining in past videos about how some of these philosophers can be um, misunderstood or misinterpreted even by professional philosophers who are not necessarily experts uh, in studying uh, ethics or in studying um, Kant's philosophy particularly. I've spent a lot of time with Kant and it, I'm not just being like I'm you know snooty being snooty about this or something but just just in my experience Kant is not easy to grasp and it, there's so many opportunities for getting close but not quite in a way that has a really big impact on the view that results. So I want to try to present uh, as accurate a picture as I can for you, even though this is going to be an abbreviated format. Um, and actually, one thing I was thinking about, how, how do I want to get started, since I'm going to do this a little different from my other classes when I teach Kant. And I thought, you know, a nice transition here between Mill and Kant 
that will also help with kind of getting us into Kant's head um, is to talk again about relativism and realism and subjectivism. And I think I was talking a little bit about this in the last lecture with Mill, especially the part about justification. Um, how Mill's trying to justify everything in his theory with sentimentalism and the arguments that he's using. Um, if you remember back to the realism relativism debate, we had realists who believed if you're a moral realist, then you believe in objective, universal, moral truth. So there are answers to questions about, like, what is the just life? Or what does social justice mean? Or how ought we to live? What things are right and wrong and good and bad? Um, Realists believe that there is an ultimate answer to that. It's not just something based on human opinion or human conventions in society or something like that. That there, There's real right and wrong here about this. We can have correct and incorrect views about moral matters. Um, and the realists thought that this was true because those facts are stance independent. That is, um, the well maybe not the views are not stance independent, but what they represent, the moral reality, is independent of any of our say-sos. It doesn't depend on our judgments or our subjectivity in any respect at all. When I say stance independent or stance dependent, I'm referring to stance in terms of a subjective stance. Um, how I look at something, as a human, I'm always looking at reality from a position. And I can't really get outside of that. <clears throat> but um, Truth doesn't depend on that, according to the moral realist. And I, actually, I guess I'd say some moral realists believe we can get in touch with that world of universals and, and objective facts and things like that. Um, but uh, um, there also is maybe you could still be a realist and believe that we don't have access to that. So you could be a skeptic about our ability to have moral knowledge while still thinking that these truths are sort of independent. Okay, so that's just a brief recap of realism. Relativism, on the other hand, thought that truth is, moral truth, is stance dependent. <clears throat> but the stance, um, the sort of subjectivity that the relativist links truth with is just belief and values. So because of that, and because we all have different beliefs and values, the relativist thought that it makes sense to say there's no objective universal truth. Okay, so very, very different here. Um, under relativism, there isn't a ultimate right and wrong. Um, you can't be wrong. You just have your truth, right? Whatever your perspective is, that's the truth for you, uh, something like that. So everyone's kind of got their own truths, right? There's no universals. Um, now take a look at Mill, and Kant is going to be in this boat too. Both Mill and Kant believe in a position called subjectivism, which incorporates some elements of both. Um, <clears throat> the way I'm defining subjectivism for our purposes here, some other philosophers sometimes talk about it in different ways, but the way I'm talking about it here is the subjectivist believes truth is stance dependent. So if we're moral subjectivists, we're saying the truths of morality do depend on our subjectivity. They're, they're contingent on that in some respect, but they're still universal objective truth. Even within the domain, the hope like never being able to escape from human subjectivity, there still could be objective universal truth. And, and, or not just could be, but is, that there is. And Mill definitely is in this boat. Uh, and you can see it in the, his philosophy as we've been discussing it, um, especially the sentimentalism. So Mill's saying, um, ultimately, the only type of rational justification that could be provided, any kind of reasoning or non-arbitrariness for moral claims, just comes down to how we feel about things. And feelings are definitely subjective. But Mill thought that what's true of us <clears throat> is that there are some feelings that are universal. Namely, the feelings we have around utility. That we all care about utility. We all count that as a good. That's a common desire. Um, if you did read any of, of the reading, chances are you caught Mill talking about this. I think I might have mentioned in my lecture last time too. Uh, the universal sympathy for all mankind that he mentions. He thinks deep in all of our souls is this kind of feeling and drive to be concerned about not just our own utility but each other as well. Um, and so Mill tries to find universality within that world of subjectivity. Or even better yet, if you remember me talking about 
how Mill's thinking of uh, the objective uh, facts about quality as a variable for utility. There's supposed to be this kind of like objective ranking of which things, which utilities sort of have greater weight and which ones have less. That That's what quality was representing. And you remember me drawing that picture of the map of all possible human experience? I mean, that's a world of subjectivity. That's like a complete map of human subjectivity, which maybe is what gives it objectivity. So we could treat as sort of the objective truth here, whatever would be the preferences of someone who is fully informed about all the options and had tasted them and was sensitive to all of those things. Now, such a person is impossible, but it's an ideal that we could get closer to or further away from, and that's all we need to have um, hope in a kind of objectivity, that there's, there's something grounding this whole thing. Even if we're a little bit far away from it, uh, we can learn and grow more and get closer to approximating that, or maybe be relatively ignorant um, or insensitive and and thus further away from understanding that truth. Um, I tried to connect this with the very intuitive notion that I think we're, a lot of us, uh, maybe all of us are familiar with from life experience, which is that as you get older, it feels like you, feels like, right, this is all up for debate, but certainly it seems we've got a common intuition that shows up quite a bit where we feel like we're learning something. We're learning more about life and what truly has value and thinking back on our old preferences and being like, yeah, that wasn't very informed. Um, and now I know better. I've had more experiences. I know about other people's experiences more and just all the things that life has to offer and that human experience uh, reveals. So um, maybe there's some objectivity there. Um, Kant's going to be doing something similar uh, in the sense that he, he does think that uh, moral truth depends on something subjective about us, but not just like relativism, what beliefs and values we happen to have, not those contingencies, and also not the contingencies of our feelings. So Kant's going to look in a very different place, and in sort of a weird place. This is part of, this would be connected with the, the bigger background. If any of you are curious about knowing the bigger background behind Kant and where his philosophy is coming from, I would love to talk to you about it. Uh, I'm just I'm trying to keep the curriculum somewhat manageable, but if you want to kind of have a chat sometime, talk over the phone or something, or do another video chat on some day and, and find out a little bit more, I, I'd be happy to fill you in. It's pretty cool stuff. I mean, like I said, he's so original. I've definitely enjoyed um, studying Kant over the years myself as a student of philosophy. Um, and, I, and, I, and to be perfectly honest, um, I, I have some more sympathy with Kant than a lot of other philosophers. I, I'm not a straight-up Kantian when it comes to my own moral theory, but um, there's, a, I, there's a lot I like in him, and a lot I, I think that there is there to like. Um, but Kant's not without his problems either. Okay, um, so how is Kant going to do this whole subjective thing? He's not going to be doing it on emotions. Um, if you remember before when I was introducing Mill, I was I kind of was, before this whole section, I was saying... Uh, all these philosophers really take seriously, I think, how ambitious is the project of creating a universal objective moral theory. Like, that's a big, big deal. Humans are so different, and our opinions are so diverse. We have so many different ideas and perspectives on what is good and bad and right and wrong in this world. Um, to say, hey, I think I've got an answer for everybody under all times and places. I mean, that's, that's a tall order. And there's big concerns about bias. Um, sort of our subjectivity creeping in in a way that defeats it, our ability to maybe get at something objective. Um, that's a concern that Kant's going to share too. And I, I might even, I, I hesitate a little bit on this, but I might even say Kant takes this problem more seriously than even Mill. And I think Mill's taking it pretty seriously. But Kant's going to go like, even deeper. Think um, just on this level, this little quick thing. Mill is thinking about what every human cares about based on our feelings. But we could imagine beings like aliens or something that have very different psychologies. Maybe they feel emotions, but they feel emotions in a very different way than we do. I think a lot about other um, science fiction stuff. So I'm a big Star Trek fan, I think I've mentioned before. Um, and sometimes Star Trek plays around with that too, of like, 
what is morality? Star Trek loves to talk about moral dramas, and it's pretty philosophical itself. But what 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 does morality look like if you're dealing with people or persons, not necessarily human persons, maybe alien persons, but still people who just have a radically different type of psychology, who experience the world in a really, really different way? Kant's interested in having an answer about morality that's not just for human beings, but for any sentient person, no matter what. So like Kant, Kant's thinking, if I'm going to have an objective moral theory, an objective moral law, um, like for utilitarianism, the principle of utility is the moral law, Kant's going to look for something similar to that. <clears throat> He's thinking, if that's going to be actually justified as being the objective true answer, then I got to take into account um, all of these other possible things in, of how we could be set up to experience reality. Kant's going <clears> to <throat> sort of say about his own theory that if it has any validity at all, it has to have validity equally for humans or non-human animals, um, like maybe dolphins or elephants or uh, other types of non-human animals on our planet that are sentient, that can think and reason and do things for reasons, have intentional um, actions, that have a self-awareness, that have a robust cognitive inner life, we might say, if we're getting a little fancy. And equally for any theoretically possible alien species um, that has a completely different evolutionary history um, and, and kind of way of encountering the world through sensations, um, but if they think at all and do things for reasons, if they've got kind of a, an intentional mind, then this law, the, these moral laws should apply equally to them too. That's a big deal. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big claim. And Kant's saying he can't, he can't go softball on this. Um, one thing that might be also helpful early on here um, this is one of this is the first of many ways in which Kant can be misunderstood. So uh, take a look at the title of the the primary source reading that I gave you for Kant: a grounding of a metaphysics of morals. Kant's objective here, and everything I'm going to be kind of discussing in these lectures, I might go a little bit further than the grounding, but for the most part, I'm going to just stick to that. Uh, it's his most famous work on morality. It really is just trying to lay the foundations for a moral theory. It's not going to be working out everything into the details. Utilitarianism is really powerful because of that, right? I was I was remarking on that in my previous lectures, that utilitarianism gives you an abstract principle um, that works on the theoretical level, but it, it's like, boom, it doesn't take much at all to theoretically be able to connect the dots with actual circumstances, real life situations. Um, and for Kant, that's going to be a little uh, harder. It's not going the the foundations of the theory and the moral law he's going to provide doesn't immediately speak to particular behaviors or not. But it is going to contextualize and inform those choices in a way that Kant believes is necessary. That that's his intentions with this theory. He's trying to set up a solid foundation of what is absolutely necessary when it comes to uh, acting in a way that is that he's going to say acting in a way that has moral worth or that's we'd say ultimately appropriate morally um, he's looking for the foundations the necessary foundations all the details um, there's there's some room about that and I will indicate how um, how Kant might try to attack some of the details how he might take his foundations and then extend it in application um, and there's definitely some pretty obvious places for um, application, but there's also some places that aren't as fuzzy, and I'll try to help with that. Another metaphor that might be useful here is that Kant's trying to define this kind of absolute boundary of uh, what is definitely not moral. So what is what is absolutely not even an option. But within that fence, there still might be some questions of like this or this. You know, Kant's moral law is going to provide this kind of barrier, this boundary on what a moral life could look like. Um, but there's still some questions to make in in and around there. Um, but he's he's always trying to be very, very careful here because he's looking for a necessary foundation. That means he can't build his necessary foundation on anything that's contingent about us. That's where the concern about bias would show up. 
um, to try to translate con this kind of philosophical language from something that might be a little more intuitive for you. If Take the most sloppy example of this. If I create a universal moral theory that's based only on my feelings, my conscience, and my experience, that's not going to work, right? I'm just projecting the contingencies of my life onto everybody else without taking into account the differences of what might be going on in their circumstances. I mean, if it was just based on my own intuitions, my own moral conscience, and nobody not taking into account anyone else's, it's kind of like, well, if I was you instead of me, I'd have a completely different moral theory. So that means it doesn't sort of separate or give a justification for why I should pick this point of view as opposed to some other person's point of view. Kant takes that really, really seriously. And he's like, I need something more solid than that. There can't be anything contingent creeping into my theory. And, the, and it's not just Kant having an obsession around logic and reasoning. Um, Kant's going to make a big deal about reason and a big deal about logic. But it's not because he just loves those things. It, it's because only there maybe could we find something that isn't contingent, that is truly universal. Certainly the way that we reason and our reasoning is uh, going to be contingent because it's all informed by different experiences, blah, blah, blah. But maybe the capacity for reasoning, what we sometimes call reason itself, maybe that has some universals in it that we could use. Um, if anyone did take a look at the, the, gr the grounding of the metaphysics of morals and, and read part of it, I think I was recommending section two, uh, or the, the second section. Um, but if you did read the preface and the first section, right out of the gates, Kant starts talking about the divisions of the sciences and the different areas of philosophy. And he's grouping them based on kind of two major variables. One is the distinction we've already talked about before about making claims that are descriptive versus ones that are normative. So descriptive claims is just about how the world is. And there's logic and metaphysics, which is about what's necessary in the descriptive world. And then there's um, science, empirical science and physics, which is concerned about the contingent laws of our universe. But maybe there could be another universe that has that plays by different rules. Like in our universe, the speed of light is a certain value. But why did it have to be that value? I mean, you, we could imagine a universe in which the speed of light is some different value. Um, so those are contingent laws. They're, they're necessary for our world, but they're not metaphysically necessary or logically necessary because we can imagine possible worlds that don't play by those rules. And that's the second variable. So you've got the distinction between descriptive claims and normative claims, but then within that, Kant is sensitive to a distinction between what is contingent and what's necessary. And contingencies are always going to be based on experience. Experience is, is itself contingent. You and I have different experiences. We have a different, we've received different sensations from the world. Um, and how the world even is, is a matter of contingency. Um, so that's, that's all going to work out that way. And that's why science always proceeds from observations, right? Empirical science is making claims about reality that are based on experience, based on observation, and that's always going to be contingent. And scientists always accept that. They're like, yeah, we're talking about natural laws, but really they're based on the contingencies of the states of affairs of our universe, and our knowledge about that is based on the contingencies of um, our uh, experiences of that world. So, um, so that's contingent side. But even when it comes to claims about existence, there's some things about the reasoning that happens there that's not contingent and that's actually universal. And logic is a really good example of that. Uh, if you've ever taken any logic or studied it a little bit, you know that logic is all about understanding the form of thinking. And this is a big deal for Kant. Um, but he's also going to say the same thing is happening here on the normative side as well. Um, <clears throat> he talks about something he labels cultural anthropology. And that's basically the study of the contingencies of human beings' moral opinions. So uh, the sort of um, different opinions that we have about morality or the um, different cultural standards that we have, um, <clears throat> those are all contingencies. They change from time and place. Um, if, if you think of morality as solely a social phenomenon, then 
then you would think maybe it's all contingent and subjective in that in the in the sense with the contingency behind it but Kant actually says that morality itself cannot be contingent it has to be necessary it has to be universal because the form of its claims is universal um, if you did check out the reading you might have been wondering about all this language that Kant uses about a priori and a posteriori and these are technical terms of art and philosophy um, a priori and a posteriori basically um, is a distinction in our claims based on what those claims are justified by. So if I'm saying a claim or a piece of knowledge is known a posteriori, that means it's known on the basis of experience and is thus, therefore, contingent. So science is an a posteriori discipline of human inquiry because it's completely based on our experience and our experience is contingent. Okay, so you need experience to know about scientific claims. The world of scientific inquiry needs experience. I can't just sit in my armchair here and be like, yeah, so I think subatomic physics works like this, right? I got to do some experiments and collect some observations and some data to justify my uh, scientific theories. Uh, we can't just speculate about stuff and that's going to count as knowledge. In science, you always have to back it up with some kind of evidence that is collected from experience. So that's an a posteriori science or, or branch of philosophy. A priori claims, claims that are known a priori, do not depend on experience to be known. It might be through experience that I become acquainted with them, but those beliefs are not justified empirically. And a really good example of this, although it's maybe not the best example for Kant, because Kant's got some weird things to say about this, but never mind that. In terms of how a lot of people think about mathematics, they conceive of it as an a priori discipline. So I guess Kant would say it's a priori, but in this weird synthetic a priori. Anyway, don't, don't worry about that. There's a lot of weird details with Kant. Um, so take, take math. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Why is that true? Or what justifies me in believing that? It's not that in the past I ran all these experiments where I took two things and put them together with another two things, and lo and behold, they turned into four things. Um, it's, not, it's not like I had to do the scientific method to discover the laws of mathematics. Um, the things that make mathematical claims true when they're true uh, has everything to do with just the concepts involved. If I just look at what two is, what addition is, what four is, what equality is, um, then I can confirm that this claim must be true, that it's not possible for it to be false. Things that are true on pain of contradiction, like their opposites involve a contradiction so they can't be true, are things that are logically true. They're known logically. Um, and a lot of people have uh, hopes that mathematics can be completely built out of just logic. That's something a priori because it doesn't depend on experience for the justification. Now, I don't know about you, but... I learned addition through experiences. Um, I was homeschooled, so my mom taught me this stuff. Um, but, you know, she showed me coins on a table and counting and all this sort of thing. And those experiences acquainted me with these mathematical concepts. But once I got the concepts, I know them, right? And they're not dependent on the contingencies of the universe. It's not like in some other possible universe, 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 4. And that's actually a little thought experiment I like to use to, to explain this. Um, Imagine uh, you have a special spaceship, a spaceship that lets you travel between alternate dimensions of reality. Um, you can, you know, think about this in whatever kind of movie way you want to. We're not going to really push the metaphysics of this thought experiment too hard, um, but think like parallel universes or something like that. So let's say you you get in your spaceship, you press the warp button, you go off to some alternate universe. As soon as you warp into that universe, you know, a lot of, it's, it's almost like all bets are off. Not quite, but it's pretty close because you don't know anything. You don't know if Trump won the last election or not. You don't know um, whether America even exists. You don't know what is the evolutionary history of human beings on the planet. Like, none of that stuff you can take for granted because in this alternate universe, things could have gone in a totally different direction, right? Laws of nature could be totally different. Um... You know, you don't, anything that's empirical, anything that's based on knowledge of experience, that's about states of affairs in the world, it's a crapshoot. But as soon as you warp into that alternate universe, 
you still know 2 plus 2 equals 4. There's no way that just by changing the circumstances of reality that you'll change those truths. Okay? And that kind of a priori knowledge is how Kant thinks morality works. And he's got kind of a really basic argument for this, um, which I've kind of talked about before, um, with the whole distinction between the descriptive world and the normative world. Um, if descriptive claims are about how the world is, the normative claims are about how it ought to be. And you can't tell how the world ought to be just by looking at how it is. It doesn't depend on that. Whatever is going to ground a moral theory, which is all about the oughts of reality, um, it's, we, we're, we wouldn't even initially expect it to be connected at all with how things are in experience. I mean, experience just shows us, reveals to us how the world is. If moral truths don't depend on how the world is, but rather about how it ideally ought to be, then we could say this is going to be an a priori discipline. Um, knowledge from experience isn't going to inform that. It's not going to be useful to the justification of these claims. So Kant is really interested in trying to figure out, okay, what do they depend on then? What kinds of standards can, they, can we use to evaluate um, normative claims? And this is where he gets off the boat right at the get-go from where Mill's going. Because Mill wants to use sentimentalism, right, for the, as the, that's how he thinks normative justification works. It depends on our feelings. And Kant's like, nah, I can't, I can't go that direction. Because how we feel is a contingent fact about us. Even if there's a way that all human beings feel, that might just be a contingent fact about our evolutionary history. That we developed certain types of feelings, affective dispositions, uh, emotional dispositions, um, and it could have gone a different way. We could have, we could feel really differently about reality. So if we want a truly objective universal moral theory, it's not going to be able to be based on our emotions. More on that in a little bit. Um, but this is, I, I hope this is helping you to kind of locate where Kant's mind is at and how he is going to be taking a kind of very analytical and logical approach to this and has a huge concern about bias. He really wants to cross his T's and, and dot all of his I's here um, and not let anything contingent creep into his moral theory, at least for the foundation. Right? Like I've been saying, Kant's building a foundation first of what's necessary. Can't be contingent. It's got to be all a priori. But then after that, then maybe we'll start be able to filter in um, how those universals, how those necessary things about morality now apply in contingent circumstances. Um, I think I might have used this example before, um, but it's fine if it's familiar. It's actually probably better if it's familiar. Um, maybe you remember my little argument. Um, I'm, I'm like talking to a couple kids or something, and one of them is hitting the other, and I say, you shouldn't hit other people, right? Don't Or don't hit your siblings, or um, it would be wrong to do that. And the kid might ask me, why? Give me a reason for that. Why should I think that that's an objectively true claim? And I might say, and I think we often respond in this way, hitting causes pain. When you're punching them, you're causing owies. This is our the little sign language we use with my baby for, for an owie, for pain. Um, so uh, it causes pain. Now, hitting causing pain is a contingent fact about us and our universe. If we were built differently than, you know, applying the same amount of force to our bodies may not involve any pain at all. Um, <clears throat> it's a sort of a contingent fact about our universe that these things are hooked up. We might not even feel pain. I mean, it, I, I can imagine, uh, we, pain seems to be pretty important for our evolutionary history, but I could imagine the development of a life form uh, that doesn't have a pain sense, sense faculty, and maybe they can still find a survival niche. Or there's something else <clears throat> that's the mechanism responsible for being alerted to danger and stuff like that. It's conceivable. It's conceivable. And for Kant, that's good enough as a counterexample, as something that reveals a contingency of a claim. But think back to this little argument, right? It might sound really good. Okay, why is hitting wrong? Because when you hit people, it causes pain. And maybe for a kid, that's all they really need. They're, they're just missing that piece. And once they realize, oh... I didn't realize that when I do this, I'm hurting that other person. I don't like to be hurt, you know, this kind of reasoning. Then they might be like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, that convince, convinces me. Good argument, right? <clears throat> but logically, this argument 
doesn't work, but it could be fixed pretty easily if we just throw in another premise. Causing pain is wrong. Now that's not contingent, right? That's not just a description of how things causally work in our universe, right? To say causing pain is wrong is a moral claim. And it's one that it has this a priori form to it. And if that truly is a universal moral obligation, then we can apply it into these contingencies of being like, if this action causes pain, then that action is wrong because causing pain is wrong. And that's a little, that gives you a really simplistic, but still pretty on the money idea here, uh, or getting us in, kind of in the ballpark here of how Kant is thinking about building his moral theory. He wants to figure out what's necessary and universal, what are the ultimate mandates of morality, and then figure out how it applies into the contingencies from there. The contingencies are gonna be relevant down the road. What Kant wants to avoid is mistaking something that's contingent for something that's necessary and universal. We need a necessary universal foundation for ethics, logically, and that can't be just a projection of something contingent, like my personal feelings about things I project onto everybody. Can't do that. So Kant's like, on guard. And as we go forward here in my lecture proper, this has kind of all been a little bit of a setup. Um, I've, I've got a map here, actually, uh, a diagram that I encourage you to be taking a look at um, to follow along here, and I'll bring it up on screen for those of you watching on YouTube. Um, but I like to describe this whole journey we're going to go on with Kant as Kant searching for what could fit the bill for a universal necessary moral law. What could actually serve justifiably in that role? Uh, and I like to present Kant as sort of not assuming that there is going to be one. It might be that we're looking for this thing because we know it's a theoretical kind of object. Maybe we can't find it. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe there isn't anything that is necessary and universal in ethics. And there have definitely been some philosophers who thought that's true. So even on this point, I don't think Kant is uh, begging the question or engaging in circular reasoning or just assuming something without argument, even on this basic matter of is there objective moral truth? He does think that there is, but he's not assuming it. That's going to be a conclusion that needs to be justified rather than something that he's just, you know, starting from an assumption on. Um, so even here, Kant is like, I need to do my job in shouldering my burden of proof to make sure that when I'm making these grand claims that they are actually justified and not just some kind of projection, not just some kind of bias creeping in here, uh, masquerading as a universal truth. It's got to be really necessary. <clears throat> so Kant's setting the bar really, really high. Um, for those of you who are in the chat, if you're wondering about this diagram I just mentioned, it's in uh, Canvas. It's in the Files section. Um, under the uh, In Files, there's a folder called Theory. And the, the document that I have in mind here is something called Kant Diagram 2014, which is a much prettier version of a previous version of this diagram that I drew up. And it's kind of like, it looks like a concept map. And it's my best attempt at organizing everything Kant's saying into a kind of sequence that makes logical sense and kind of follows a linear train of thought here and, and kind of mirrors Kant's own reasoning. And uh, Kant kind of jumps around on this, but I tried to collect all of his thoughts and, and put them into uh, a more accessible package. Um, I can also do some screen sharing here on the video uh, to try to clue you in on what's happening. Um, but if you want to just pull that from the file section and follow along there, I, I definitely invite you to. Um, okay, so uh, going forward here, Kant's on the hunt for the moral law, and we'll see if he can find it. And it's kind of like, um, I like this metaphor a lot, like this hunting metaphor. It's kind of like there's this field, this whole field, uh, and we're like, is there a fox? We're like trying to hunt a fox or some wild animal, something like that. And we don't know if we go into that field that we're going to find one. Um, but we're going to look all over the whole field before we pronounce that there isn't one, right? There's a lot of places we could be looking. Kant's going to say we could go here or here. Okay, it can't be there. So kind of process of elimination. It's got to be over here. Well, maybe here and here, breaking it down, kind of like slowly hunting down what could serve as the moral law. Also, in case you're sort of paying attention here and this question's jumped up to your mind, you're like, 
Why, why won't the uh, principle of utility work? Maybe that could be a universal law. That's what Mill was trying to do, right? The principle of utility is the master measuring stick that then evaluates all the other contingencies of life. Um, if you're wondering why causing pain is wrong, principle of utility, boom, done. Can answer all the questions. Hang on to that thought. We're going to get there. Um, another thing that Kant is often misunderstood on is what exactly is it that he's disagreeing with with Mill? Um, I think I've seen a lot of ways in which Mill and Kant are kind of put at odds, and definitely Kantianism and utilitarianism bash heads on a number of deep issues. But I've also seen that conflict uh, sort of inflated beyond what they actually disagree with. Um, in some ways, I think Kant would be fairly sympathetic with some of the bigger theoretical moves that Mill is making. There's just one big one that he just can't do, one, or there's two big ones. One big one is sentimentalism. He's not he's not down with sentimentalism. But maybe there's another way you could prove the principle of utility that isn't just based on our feelings about things. But anyway, um, we'll get to that uh, eventually. That'll definitely show up as a as a highlight, a landmark on our on our little hike up Kant Mountain. Um, where we're going to find the categorical imperative at the end of the at the end of the trail. Um, just for those of you in the chat, um, how are things going so far? Any questions popping up? I wanted to check in, see. Um, definitely, if you have questions, it could be useful for everybody else. I haven't gotten any interruptions so far, so just thought I would check in. People have been dropping in and out here, but. Hmm. Oh no. Um, I wonder if that's my internet. Um, internet's been a little goofy here. Um, I could try resetting and seeing if that helps at all. Um, yeah, here, I'm going to pause the video recording and let's just kind of... Okay, so those of you who watch on YouTube, things got really goofy technical difficulties um, but I think we're just gonna tough it out tonight and hopefully I can make sure this doesn't happen in the future um, so getting into Kant's ethical theory proper um, I, I do like this model uh, of him being on the search for a moral law something that could serve as um, a necessary universal um, grounding for all the rest of the moral claims that we'd want to make um, yeah, yeah, and the way that Kant's going to approach this, I, I'm, I'm not doing all the other Kant backstory um, lecture uh, about his broader views on metaphysics and the mind and experience and cognition, thought and uh, everything. Um, and he has a really interesting model of that. Maybe, maybe I'll just give you a little tid tidbit. Kant's really responsible for um, the modern field of cognitive science. I mean, without Kant's theoretical framework, I mean, maybe sooner or later someone would do this thing, but Kant was really the one to pioneer the idea of thinking about the mind as a kind of, that, or, and thinking as a kind of functional process, kind of like a machine almost. Although Kant is going to be the first person who's going to say, you can't reduce the mind to just a causal mechanism. Um, and that gets into some deep issues. But sort of recognizing what's the structure of thought, what enables any thought to happen at all. If you're going to have any conscious being with experiences who's thinking about things, who's sentient or self-aware or self-conscious, um, what kinds of things need to be going on? Uh, and for Kant, there's form and there's content to experience and they come from different um, cognitive mechanisms and rational mechanisms, really. Uh, Kant's sort of deconstruction of uh, even subjective experiences, um, from his point of view, they're deeply imbued with rationality and logical structure. And the same thing is going to be true when he's thinking about um, normative judgments, judgments about what's good and bad and right and wrong and all that good stuff. But um, if you're looking on the diagram here, and I will do some screen sharing um, here for those of you who are still around in the chat. Um, so let's get this up. Um, doo -doo. Oh, come on. 
show up. I want to look at this photo. It's not letting me do it. What? Hmm. All right, let's just we'll just do it this way. So you can see my whole Oh, that's not what I wanted. Here we go. There we go. Um, whoops. What the heck? Okay, control. There we go. Um, I'm going to have to make this a little smaller. Okay. So those of you in the chat uh, can see my whole screen, um, but those of you who are watching this on YouTube, you're just seeing um, a little part of this. Okay, so this thing in total, you can see there's this whole concept map that I've made, kind of breaks down all the major moving parts of Kant's moral theory. Um, but he's got these kind of different, what he calls the propositions of morality. And this is him carefully, logically building up um, uh, his moral theory from the most minimal foundations he possibly can. And we're going to start there with the first proposition of morality. And, th and this is going to be really like a hunt, like this breakdown of branching pathways is him hunting down all the different places that we could find a moral law. But this is where Kant starts. First proposition of morality. That just taken logically, the concept of morality involves two logical elements, conceptual elements to it. That if we're talking about moral questions, uh, if we're trying to figure out what could even possibly serve as a moral law, the, the thing that we're talking about here, the phenomenon of morality, if, even if it, if it even exists, is going to be something that has to do with the will. It's about making, doing the right actions or the wrong actions. Um, and it concerns what's necessarily and universally good. Um, and in fact, I actually want to pull up, um, I'm going to do some drawing on Microsoft Paint here. Um, and do some illustration uh, illustrations for you to explain the second point so um, morality th this is kind of like if we recognize there's all this diversity to moral thinking um, that we disagree about morality Kant's wondering okay what are we just talking about here what's what's the field when we make moral claims what are we talking about and he's saying we're talking about something that has to do with the will that is determining action and it's about what's necessarily good um, and universally good. And if you're wondering especially about why Kant is building the idea of necessary universal good into a conception of morality, that's a fair question to ask. You could ask, Kant, why can't morality just be about contingent truths? Why does it have to be about what's universal? Why do we have to talk about what's true for everyone? Why can't we talk about things that are just maybe sometimes good and sometimes bad? It's like, it depends kind of answer to whether something is good or bad. And Kant's got a really interesting um, argument, I think, for showing why um, the idea of necessary goodness is inescapable, even if we're talking about contingent goodness. So let me um, do a little drawing here to help. If I'm saying something is contingently good and not universally good, then I'm saying that sometimes it's a good thing, and sometimes it's a bad thing and it's not always good and it's not always bad which means that there's some kind of line here that defines the cases under which the thing is good from the cases under which that thing is bad okay so that's all we just mean by saying something is contingently good it's it's sometimes good but also sometimes bad okay now Kant would say alright fair enough but if you make a commitment to something being contingently good, you have to give some sort of account of where this line is drawn. If you want to say, is this good? Well, it depends. The next logical question to ask is, okay, depends on what? What makes for the line in the sand here? Um, is this just an arbitrary double standard? Uh, here, here's an example I like to use to explain this. Let's say um, one student comes to me after class and is like, hey, can I turn in this late work? And I'm like, sure. And then another student's like, oh, I got late work too. Can I turn in late work? And I'm like, nope. If that student, I mean, if that student is going to feel like, what is going on here? Um, they might be like, why? This, this doesn't seem fair. Their concern is that I'm saying sometimes good, sometimes bad in an arbitrary way where there is no line here 
It's just I'm like, eh, I did it for this person, not for that person. Or I'm drawing the line on some grounds that are maybe objectionable. Like if I um, only let my young students turn in late work and not my older students. I mean, that, that shouldn't matter, right? Or whether students are wearing baseball caps because I wear a baseball cap or not. That wouldn't matter. Or their race. Definitely I shouldn't be making it on race or sex or gender or anything like that, right? Um, they're going to wonder if I'm just holding a double standard. And if I'm going to be able to say, no, I'm not holding a double standard, I need to come up with some sort of rule. And this rule is a kind of pattern. Um, here, I'll make this, I'm going to make this a little bigger and more legible. Um, those of you in the chat, are you able to see what's going on here at the screen sharing? Is that working out okay? Let me know if it's not. Um, hopefully, I think this is legible enough. Um, here we go. So we've got, yay, wonderful. So I'm providing some sort of rule to prove that I'm not holding some kind of double standard here. And what that rule is going to do is basically tell us where that line is drawn. It's going to say, here's the pattern. Um, and that rule is intended to range over all the cases. I'm using the same rule consistently across all these different circumstances. Um, it's just that in one case, the rule says this is a good thing to do. In another case, it says it's a bad thing to do. So, for example, let's say my rule on late work is that... Um, if you have an excused absence, uh, then I'll take your late work. And if you have an unexcused absence, I won't. So it's kind of like if a student wasn't able to turn in their work because they got in a car accident or they're in the hospital or something, then, then yeah, I'll take it late. If a student was like, sorry, I just got really stoned and decided not to do the homework. Can I turn it in late? I'll be like, no, that's not an excused absence. Um, it's not like an excusable reason. So I won't let you turn in the late work. Now, I actually have a way looser I don't that's not my actual policy but just just as a, a example like a theoretical example here imagine that's how I work now my rule might not be a good one but at least no one could say I'm treating these cases with a double standard I'm using the same rule it's just that in this case or these cases it tells me yeah it's, it's good to accept the late work in these cases it isn't okay but I'm staying consistent I have a universal idea here now, it's certainly possible, if we want to kind of zoom out here, that the rule that I'm providing is not itself a universal rule. It might also be contingent, which means that if the rule should be used in these cases, it's a good thing in these cases, but the rule is not good in these cases. Um, the rule itself has some contingency to it. That can happen. But again, we're going to be faced with the same general problem. Kant's going to say, if you're saying that the rule is sometimes good, contingently good, then there needs to be some other rule that tells me when this rule, so rule two here, there's got to be some other rule that tells me when this rule is a good one to follow. And if this one's contingent, that's fine. You know, we can keep do doing this as many times as is necessary. But ultimately, eventually, we're going to have to get to something like uh, a universal rule to ground all this. So, you know, this even rule two might be contingent. Eventually, we're going to get at some sort of universal rule, universal rule that covers all possible cases, all possible contingencies. And that's logically required. And it's required for two reasons. One, if I don't have a universal rule that all these other rules are justified under, then they're not justified. They're like arbitrary double standards. But there's also another point here that Kant has in mind. Um, it's also kind of like uh, if I didn't have these rules separating which cases count and which ones don't, I might not even be able to understand what you mean by saying this thing is good. Right? So this is this is where Kant blows my mind. I, I mean, when I first counted this idea, I was like, this really, really helps. And it helps with understanding why would ethicists be so concerned about universal and objective rules. The reason is not just on the grounds of needing a rational justification that deals with all the diversity and potential counterexamples and not wanting to beg questions and assume your conclusion, circular reasoning, all that stuff. That's true, and that's pretty weighty. But also that maybe 
I don't even know what you're saying. You're not saying anything intelligible or clear unless I know under which cases you think this is a good thing and under which cases you don't think it's a good thing. Right? There could be a lot of ambiguity there. You might not even know. I mean, I could be confused about my own judgments. Um, I might be willing to say that this thing is good, but in what way am I saying it's good? What's a variable here? Where is that line drawn? And without knowing the cases that are on one side of that and the cases on the other, I may not even know what my thought is. Right? It might not be well defined. Uh, it might be vague to the point of unintelligible. And that so the rational justification is part of the stakes here, but also just the intelligibility of my judgments. And Kant really buys into that. He really thinks that when I'm not being a moral philosopher and thinking about all times and places and everything, when I'm just like, this is good right now, at some level, if my thought is even intelligible at all, that it has the structure of a universal claim backing it up. I might not be able to have access to that with conscious self-reflection, but it's necessary. Th and this phenomenon shouldn't be that weird because it's happening all the time. When you use, when you speak, if, you're, if English is your second language, then maybe you're a little more self-conscious about English conventions. But whatever is your first language, unless you really study it later as like a linguist, and, and you could become aware of them, but just being able to communicate, like listening to my lecture where I'm talking so fast and putting a lot of ideas out there, or you're communicating your thoughts to somebody else, you're not thinking about all the rules of English and like what definitions words have and the rules of grammar and all that. You just talk, right? But if you didn't know all those things, you couldn't be competent in the language. That know-how at some level logically depends on all those rules. And if we weren't sharing the same rules of English, we wouldn't be able to communicate, right? So the fact that we can even communicate at all is sometimes kind of amazing when you're thinking about how much of this is happening subconsciously or unconsciously. And that's kind of how Kant thinks about the logical construction of thought as well. That's not a the perfect analogy, but it, it'll, it'll be, it's a quick and dirty version and it's good enough for us right now for our purposes in this class. For Kant, there is this kind of underlying logical structure to even our judgments about contingent goodness. It all goes back to universal goodness sooner or later. So that's why Kant is putting into um, the first step of the first proposition of morality here that morality is about um, uh, it's about it concerns the will. It's about how the will pushes me to act one way versus another, and it's about what's necessarily and universally good. Now, uh, another thing that we can talk about here is the combination of these two things. If you did take a look at the reading, you heard Kant talk a lot about duty. And that's what he, his first proposition of morality is basically to say, uh, moral actions are actions done from duty. Now, that may not seem very enlightening. And if it is, it might be for the wrong reasons. Because um, the word duty and moral obligation is super loaded for us. I mean, we... We have a lot of baggage connected with that word, I think. And for Kant, it, it doesn't, it, it's a technical word. He's using it in a technical theoretical sense, and it's not supposed to have a ton of baggage connected with it. But all Kant means by duty is just aligning your will with what is necessarily and universally good. So doing one's duty is just following what's good. If my will is aimed at actions or ends or purposes that are not what's actually good, then I'm not doing my duty. So that's all he means by it. It's kind of like do the right thing, you know, make the right decisions, pursue the right ends, have the right purposes in life. Um, if, if we say there's something morally problematic about someone who is insensitive to how, they, how their actions affect other people, we're just saying that part of what is good is what happens to other people. And your will needs to be sensitive to that. And sometimes our wills are not sensitive to that, in which case we're not doing our duty. So for Kant, that's all it means. It's a very, very thin idea. Now the idea of duty is combining those two logical features. If morality is about the will, that's what we're talking about when we're asking moral questions is what should we do? Um, how should our will be determined in action? And it's about what's necessarily and universally good, theoretically, then the combo of that is the idea of duty, of aligning the will with what's good. So that's all Kant means by that, with that first proposition of morality. And really, um, I want to emphasize uh, explicitly that Kant's not assuming anything here. He's not, um, 
he's not well the assumptions he's making are really trivial and just conceptual truths he's not allowing himself to any substantial moral claim here that he's not entitled to rationally it's not like he's assuming anything or letting anything sneak in through the back door here he's just saying this look if we are going to find a moral law it's going to be something that meets this description it's going to be about what's necessarily and universally good it's going to have that form to it and it's going to be some kind of guidance for the will it's going to have to be addressing the will um, and that's it and maybe we won't find something like that it's kind of like um, getting a description of a person and you're looking around for this person you're like nothing is matching this description you know you might not find it maybe the description was just made up maybe it wasn't based on a real person um, but maybe it is too so if we are going to find a moral law, it's going to answer to this theoretical description. Maybe we won't find it, but maybe we will. But at least we know what we're looking for. And we'll know, maybe, how to tell whether we can find one or not. So this first proposition of morality is kind of a big deal for Kant um, because it is going to give us um, what we're looking for. It sets the theoretical goal here of a moral theory. All right. That might seem like I was belaboring it. Uh, something that seems really basic and, and maybe even trivial or obvious to you, but uh, I promise you it, a lot hinges on that. Kant's going to touch back on that quite a lot. Okay, so let's go back to screen sharing here, um, and I want to show you the diagram again. Woo! All right, so zooming out a little bit. The next proposition of morality is going to involve this kind of um, I, I would actually kind of call this moral psychology, the way Kant's going to progress here. Um, so this is kind of like picking up um, on the idea that morality has something to do with the will. Kant's next question is like, okay, how does the will get determined for actions? Let's just figure out how we work. Like, how? what are the options here? And again, Kant isn't doing something that's really what we might call psychology, definitely not empirical psychology. Because Kant doesn't think that what he's describing is something that's contingent about human beings. But this would be for any being that has a will. There's only so many ways it could work metaphysically. Okay, um, sort of, you might say, theoretically. Um, there's some universals here. And so Kant is thinking about actions and how we explain them. So the will is sort of this mechanism that determines how we end up acting. Um, I think a good frame of reference here for the will, if we're looking for a theoretical definition, would be kind of like the way the ancient Greeks thought of this thing they called an animus. So the Kant's not exactly on, this isn't, again, a perfect theoretical description, but again, I think it's a quick and dirty version that'll do for us. Um, the ancient Greeks like looked at the world in, in, in a kind of really basic way, and they were like, you know what? some things are different from other things like chairs don't move of their own accord they don't seem to have an animus something that animates them but animals and humans definitely have this thing humans are running around and animals are running around and they have behavior that seems to be kind of self-driven they're not um, at least not obviously being influenced directly by other things like if I pick up a chair and move it then the chair's condition has changed, but as a result of something external to the chair. Um, a human is dancing around, or like my little baby has been, he loves to dance, he was dancing all afternoon, and it's not like I'm picking him up and making him dance or something. He's moving of his own accord. And the Greeks kind of refer to this power that does that in people as the animus. And that's maybe how you can think about Kant's way of thinking about the will here. Uh, it's, it's something that is just the mechanism in us that determines how we end up behaving and acting. And there's different ways that the will could be determined for something different. And Kant divides them in the, into these two categories, what he calls self-generated laws and what he calls laws of inclination. Um, actually, if any of you have seen um, uh, Donnie Darko, there's this scene in the movie Donnie Darko if, this doesn't, if you haven't seen it, don't worry about it. But it, it's a very compelling scene. It's kind of trippy, kind of like a dream sequence almost. But uh, a character is like seeing all these weird translucent tubes coming out of people's abdomens um, that are kind of extending out in front of them in space. 
and moving, and they, they, the uh, tubes kind of, have, they chart a little course. Like, he's seeing, um, I think this is Donnie's character, he's seeing um, uh, his father in the living room has this tube that extends from him over to the kitchen into the fridge, and then he watches his father walk that path to the fridge and grab a beer and then come back. Um, and that's kind of like the will, maybe. It's it's like what's sort of directing us, the chart, the course that we've charted uh, toward doing some action or another one. Um, and let's talk first about how Kant thinks um, the will could be determined through laws of inclination, which he calls the study of anthropology, like I talked about before. Um, and uh, I want to kind of be back here with my face, because uh, I've got these... I want to explain these ideas, but that's where we're located on the map. That's what I'm talking about right now. Laws of inclination, determining the will. Oh, and actually, let me let me hold back just one second. So, in trying to scout out, when Kant's trying to scout out, what influences the will? What could be determining the will to do one action versus another? Why would we do one thing instead of something else? Um, he kind of gets his leads here by thinking about just sort of intuitive ways that we explain why we do what we do. So I'll, I've come up with this little thought experiment that might be helpful. Um, imagine we're best buds. We're really close friends. And um, every night before bed, uh, we talk on the phone. And uh, so it's like a daily daily habit that we have. And let's say last night um, we were talking on the phone, and then all of a sudden I just like, blow up at you, just start yelling at you, cussing you out, all this kind of stuff, and then I abruptly, like, hang up. We don't, we don't really do this anymore. I've got my phone, and I tap it, and I just abruptly cut off the conversation. And then you see me at school or work or something the next day, and you're like, uh, what happened, Tim? Like, you behaved this way last night on our phone conversation. Like, what was going on there? Um... What was happening? Uh, why did you do what you did? And think about these two different ways I could try to explain my action. Uh, two different accountings that I could give of why I did that action. The first one could look like this. I could say something like, Oh man, I'm so sorry about last night. I really didn't mean for that to happen. Um, I, that, it was, that was a mistake. Uh, I, I just had a terrible day yesterday. I got fired from my job. Um, my my uh, partner broke up with me and uh, I found out my mom has cancers in the hospital. It's just like all this landed on me all at once and I was so like sad and angry and fr frustrated and I, I, I just took it all out on you. I'm sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have done that. I didn't really mean the things that I said. Um, that's just what happened. Okay, so look at what's going on in that explanation. I'm trying to give you an accounting of the circumstances and the causes w that determined my behavior. So it's sort of like all these things were happening outside of my control, um, external forces, internal forces, but causal forces like stimulus, response. Right? There, and there's some laws here. There's some psychological, anthropological patterns to why people do things the way that they do them. Um, and I'm really just giving you a causal explanation of my behavior. These are the circumstances. The behavior is the effect, the result. So that's one kind of explanation we give. And it's a very common explanation that we give, too. Uh, very much so when we're making excuses. We do this sort of thing all the time when we're making excuses. Um, this is not factors that I had any control or responsibility for. That That's always kind of what goes on. And people, philosophers, who think that this is the only thing, and actually not just philosophers, but uh, maybe I'd also say pseudo-philosophers, or people who are not necessarily professional philosophers who are persuaded of this philosophical point of view of determinism, that think this is what's happening anytime someone acts, that all everyone's actions are determined by causal laws, of physics, psychology, evolution, all this kind of stuff put together. That's why people do what they do. Then one of the conclusions of that, or the natural logical tendency for that point of view, not always, there's philosophers that dispute this, but the natural tendency for this is that there is no such thing as moral responsibility. 
that no one has free will. They're not accountable for anything that they do because all actions are determined by these causal laws of nature. Um, so that's one kind of explanation. Now, you don't have to go all the way, and Kant doesn't go all the way to total determinism. Um, well, actually, that's a little complicated story. Again, I'm not going into all the all of the tangents that we could go on. I could, I'll be here all night. Um, but Kant thinks there's another way that we explain actions that isn't the causal explanation. So that's going to be what we'll talk about a little bit later as uh, self-generated laws. But let's go back to our scenario. Again, you, you see me the next day, and you're like, what's going on here? Um, and I give you a different kind of explanation. What if I said something like this? I was like, so do you remember that conversation? you remember what we were talking about? Do you remember when you said this? I thought that was bullshit, and you shouldn't say that, and I still stand by that now. I, I, didn't, I don't think that's a right way to think about this, and I got a little worked up about it, but that's because I thought you needed to hear that. You needed to hear that criticism. Like, I think what you're doing is wrong, and you should know about that, and that's why I said what I said. Oh, no, did the video just cut out? Oh, no, come on. Oh no, you can still hear me? Can't, oh, nah. Okay, I'm back. It seems uh, <laughs> none of the connections have been able to work. Um, and everyone who was in the chat is gone, and I'm so sorry to everyone for how rocky it's been tonight. That was just the most woolsey thing ever. Your connection has been interrupted. But I'm back, and we're going to be able to finish the video and get get done with uh, all the stuff we want to talk about with Kant tonight. Um, my apologies for the interruptions and stuff to the video. But we're going to be able to get all the content in here, so let's keep cracking. So when I was just leaving off, I was talking about um, this other type of explanation that I could give for why I did what I did. And it depends, uh, The really the key thing here, if the first version, I think like here's all the stuff that was going on, is giving a causal explanation. The second version is giving a rational explanation. Instead of just telling you what were the causes behind my behavior, I'm indicating to you the grounds on which I think my actions were justified, why they'd be appropriate, what, what reasons I have for making the choices that I did. A very different sort of logical space than just these causes produced this effect it's like these are the reasons why this action would make sense to do okay so it's kind of like me revealing the logic of my intentions of why i chose why or at least why i thought it was a right idea to do this now i could be wrong about that my intentions could be misguided um, i could have the wrong objects or goals but the main point here that that kant is offering is that there's just two totally different theoretical ways to explain why we do what we do. How we give rational explanations or accountings of why people do what they do. And the worlds couldn't be further apart. I mean, um, just because something makes sense doesn't mean that's what's actually going to happen, right? And just because something happens doesn't mean it makes sense. Um, our wills are vulnerable to all sorts of causes that have, like, arbitrary or no justification behind them. Bias is like this, right? Do I hold the belief on the grounds of evidence and justification for it, or do I hold the belief on a rational or irrational grounds um, of causal psychological manipulation of some sort? Um, not even if another person was manipulating me, but just whether circumstances uh, were manipulating my belief forming process. Uh, that's what we have in mind with bias, are, are those kinds of causal factors which interfere with how we choose what we're going to believe that aren't based on rational forces. So that's really what Kant's dealing with here with this part of the map. Um, between, uh, if I pull it up here again, between this world of laws of inclination and the world of self-generated laws. Now, the second proposition of morality is saying that ethics will be found over here. That if we're going to find the moral law, right, if we're going to find doing our duty, it's going to be a matter of acting on self-generated laws. If we're going to do an action that has even a shot of having moral worth, it's going to come from, um, it's going to be an action that's determined, where, where my will was determined to do that action based on intentions 
or like rules I give to myself. More on this in a second, but let's let's still let's let's focus on why Kant's thinking that uh, moral action couldn't be action done from laws of inclination. Okay, so just in what we're talking about here, these laws of inclination, these causal forces of nature that influence our actions are not self-generated. They don't come from me. Um, a good example here would be like if I have a genetic predisposition for alcoholism. Um, I didn't choose that. I didn't decide to be born into a body that has that genetic profile. That's not something I, I came up with from myself. It's something the world is giving to me. Um, I don't construct the laws of nature. They just are what they are. The world doesn't care about me. doesn't care whether it's fitting with what I want or what my intentions are. It's just going to do what it's going to do. And I'm a causal being too. I'm, I've got a brain that's physical. I have a whole system, a neurological system that is physical. And it's responsive to causal forces. Um, even just like this, like you poke someone, <gasps> you're able to manipulate their mind with physical properties. Wow. You know, it's, it's kind of magical that this, that we work this way. I guess I shouldn't say magical. It's not magical. But it is, um, it, the, the, the world of causality of how our inner lives are influenced by the forces around us, that's not something that's up to us. And that's Kant's main point there. So they're not self-generated. Um, they're not conceptual. What does that mean? Well, it means that these uh, laws of inclination work on my will, whether I'm aware of it or not. And that's definitely something we're familiar with with thinking about bias, right? Um, bias probably works the most effectively just from a causal point of view when it's not noticed, when it's happening in the background, where I'm not aware of it. I'm still influenced by it even if I'm not aware of it. I may not know that I have a genetic predisposition for alcoholism, but that's still going to make me disposed for alcoholism, right? It's still going to have its effect on me. And then finally Kant says, and this is the real kicker about them, that laws of inclination are contingent on circumstances. And we can think about that contingency in a couple different ways. One, um, everyone's different. Everyone has a different psychology. There's always going to be some details that are different. There might be some general rules. Um, and that's what the science of psychology is trying to discover, is what are sort of the patterns here, um, what sort of, what covers all the different ways in which people can be. But when it comes to any particular rule of these circumstances cause this behavior, well, maybe only for that person, and only if you're talking about Steve or Deborah or something. If it was for somebody different, they've got a different psychological system that's going to respond to th different um causal circumstances with different effects and for them it might still be a determined thing it's still a causal influence going on but those patterns of those causality are going to be different from person to person depending on genetics depending on experience depending on character all this kind of stuff um, uh, is going to have an impact and that's never the same for everybody so that's a kind of contingency but even if you wanted to talk about a science that was able to create a universal theory of psychology that handles all those different contingencies of different people, even that would just be a contingent fact about human beings. And it wouldn't get on the level of, say, what's true for any sentient being, like I was saying Kant's interested in earlier. Um, psychology is empirical. It's about the contingencies of our psychological system. If you have a different psychological system, all bets are off, right? It could have different causal apparatus to it. Um, so, uh, so for Kant, appealing to laws of nature, like any laws of nature, all laws of nature are ultimately contingent, like we were talking about with alternate universes before. Um, for Kant, if you're talking about behavior determined causally through laws of nature, causal forces as laws of nature, you're always talking about something contingent. And the fact that it's contingent means it cannot serve as a universal moral law. You can't build a universal theory of what's good and bad just based off of how we feel about being prompted to do certain actions under certain circumstances. Um, you cannot generalize to all possible scenarios, all possible circumstances, What's happening only in a small sliver of that? Of all the possibilities, we have the actual world. And that's the only thing we're looking at. 
if we're uh, we're looking at these contingent circumstances. Another reason why um, anthropology won't be a guide here is kind of going back to some stuff I said about um, like the sociological version of relativism versus the philosophical notion of relativism. That um, you know, all we're trying to do as anthropologists or as psychologists is understand how people work. It doesn't give us the basis for analyzing how they ought to. Um, it might inform that at some further level down the road, like we were talking about with like, it is significant to learn that hitting causes pain for moral reasoning, but it's not like you can generate moral rules out of just those contingent facts. Take, take the example of I tell the kid like, uh, what, you know, you shouldn't hit them. And they're like, why? And I say, well, hitting causes pain. What if they respond, I know, that's why I hit them. You're like, mm, who are your parents? Or like, I'm your parent. I did a terrible job parenting you. Right? It's like the physical facts alone don't tell you what moral or ethical significance they ought to have. Something else has to do that work. So that's why Kant's thinking, I can't build a moral theory out of this. For one thing, it's contingent. And I'm looking for something universal. That was our recipe, right? So it's not going to work. Two, just knowing how I'm causally disposed to work does not give me a guide for how I ought to. And that's what morality is also about, what's necessarily and universally good. And we can't build that off of just how we feel about things. So Kant's rejection of laws of inclination as being a source of moral guidance, or as what could be involved in an action with moral worth, also cuts against Mill's sentimentalism, because that's exactly what Mill's trying to do, right? He's trying to look at our feelings as our evidence for what is good. And Kant takes deep issue with that. He's like... There's a lot of contingency there, and I want something that's bigger than just what's universal for human beings. I want to know what's universal for any agent acting at all. If they have a will and they can direct it, they have choices to make, I want to know what's good, period, across the board. Here's another thing that's sort of similar. Um, this is maybe a little more tailored for uh, Aristotle as Kant's opponent rather than Mill. Um, but it is connected with a passage from the grounding of the metaphysics of morals. Kant at one point says, um, you know, he's looking for something that's universally good. And he, he's speaking loosely. He's not doing his really rigid reasoning that I'm, I'm walking you through right now. So he's kind of, you know, jumping ahead in the game a little bit to what he's going to talk about later. But he's giving, so he's foreshadowing here. But he says, um, think about all the things that we think are good. Pretty much like none of them are good unconditionally. They're not good necessarily or universally. They're contingently good. Um, even the like finest character traits, like having compassion and empathy and wisdom and understanding and knowledge of the world and you know being a nice person and all this kind of stuff. No matter what you'd uh, what character traits you would want to hold up as something good, um, if used for the wrong ends. They no longer seem good. And my favorite kind of modern example of this would be the villain Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal and uh, what was the other movie he was in? Uh, Red Dragon, I think. Red, I think it was Red Dragon. Um, he's a famous villain character. And I think what makes Hannibal Lecter one of the best villains of all time, uh, which I do kind of think that that's true. I'm not a big, huge fan of the movies, but... Uh, the character is very interesting because he has all of the positive traits. Like he's he is cultured and well spoken and educated and has deep empathy and understanding of people. Um, and he uses all of those traits to find people and eat them. He's a he's a cannibal. Um, funnily, I don't know what the writers were thinking when they named him. Hannibal Lecter to be evocative of cannibal. That's kind of a little goofy. Um, but <laughs> it's a little B-movie-esque. Um, but Hannibal Lecter has like all these traits that normally we'd think of as being like really positive traits. But in the context of him as a person who uses all those traits to manipulate people and get away with eating people, um, he's like a murderer uh, who does all these horrendous things, we're like, no, they're not good. Under those circumstances, we wouldn't say that they're good. So Kant's like, pretty much everything seems to work out like that. You think breathing is good? Breathing seems like it's universally good, right? It's like a low-hanging fruit. What if you're in a fire? Uh, your building's on fire. If you inhale, if you breathe, you will inhale toxic fumes and you'll die. 
So you actually need to hold your breath. That's a good thing to do. If you're underwater, don't breathe underwater. You know, pretty basic thing. Um, don't don't breathe in the middle of swimming underwater. Breathe when you get out of there. Um, you know, everything that we could say is good has those little caveats to it. So Kant's like, what could be good in itself, unconditionally? And sorry, I dropped the microphone. I'm so sorry. Um, his early answer is a good will. Now, I, like I said, I don't think he's actually making any undue assumptions here. That's just foreshadowing his conclusion. We'll get there when we get there. But um, that's, that's the direction that this is all heading in. Um, so any of these sort of things that are contingent can't, be, can't serve as the moral basis, and that includes all these feelings and character traits and stuff like that. So um, what could work? Well, let's look at the other option here. So... If I uh, can't use laws of inclination, there's still another option here, um, and that is the self-generated laws. Now, what's going on here? Well, when I'm acting on self-generated laws, this is what Kant thinks is ethics, by the way, uh, we're talking about intentional rules that I give to myself, and we call these rules maxims or imperatives. Uh, that's a terminology that gets used a lot in Kantian ethics, um, and these require reason. So what's going on here? Well, with laws of inclination, my will is getting determined by patterns that are set by nature itself, that are external to me, I don't have any participation with. They're not self-generated. If I'm going to be setting my own rules for myself through reason, Kant thinks, then it's kind of like I'm writing my own programming. So if nature programs my behavior with all these causal laws and things, when I'm using reason and intentionality to do something, it's like I'm writing my own rules for my behavior, my own program. So, like, for example, uh, if I trip while I'm walking up the stairs, which I do all the time, um, that would be an action done from laws of inclination because it's a part of the causal mechanisms of my neurological system. I, it wasn't something I was intending I didn't choose to do it deliberately. It's just kind of how my body works. I'm kind of awkward and clumsy. That's me. I choke on my own spit every day, twice a day, uh, usually. Uh, That's just something I don't intend. It just sort of happens, right? A reflex. Um, acting completely on uh, uh, laws of inclination would be like completely unintentional action. Like I'm not thinking about what I'm doing at all. I'm just acting. Okay. Um, Laws of inclination can still influence me. Oh, there's a mix. We'll talk about that later. But when I'm acting on self-generated laws, now it's like something I, I'm choosing to do. So like right now I could be like, I'm going to pick my nose. I'm doing it. I'm picking my nose. I, I did that intentionally. I, it was something I said for myself to do. Now, could that ultimately be determined by causal stuff? You know, that's actually a possibility. Hang on to that thought. We'll get there eventually. But uh, at least on, this, on the surface level here, Kant's saying, look, sure looks like something different is going on. It's not these automatic processes happening in my subconscious. I'm, I'm doing something deliberately, and I'm thinking conceptually about a goal that I'm trying to achieve. Okay? So I'm, I'm giving myself a vision that then my will enacts. Okay? So... Um, I give myself my own rules. Every night before bed, brush your teeth. And then I do that. That's acting on a self-generated law. Uh, it's being created by the faculty of reason. And that's an important thing. When Kant's talking about reason, he's not talking about always reflective reasoning, but this sort of faculty of the mind that makes reasoning possible. So even if all of us are not always rational, um, we have a faculty of reason which enables us to think at all, to make like any judgments at all, make any decisions at all, um, recognize contrasts, use concepts generally. I mean, this is all what Kant attributes to the faculty of reason. So if I'm going to write my own programming, I do this conceptually. I do it through reason. Reason is the thing that allows me to, to set up one of these like logical sequences. Every night before bed, you should brush your teeth. That's a, that's a thing I can conceive of conceptually as a rule, a rational rule, and then I apply to myself and I follow and then I act. Like, I'm going to pick my nose here and then I do it, right? Okay, so I, I thought about it and then I acted on that intention. 
So like I'm talking to you on the phone, then I, I choose to blow up at you. I'm like, you need to you need to talking to about this. Why? Because of this purpose. I think you said something I, that that you need to be called out for. Um, so that's maybe why I do it. I don't I don't do that as, as a regular practice, but um, that's just an example, right? Um, choosing to do something deliberately with a certain goal and reason in mind. Um, we'll talk about if you're thinking right now. Sometimes you, I'm, I'm used to giving this lecture. You might be thinking about rationalization right now. Hang on to that thought too. We'll get into that. Um, but there's definitely something. There's a totally different pattern going on here uh, between acting intentionally and acting on inclinations according to Kant. Um, and at least you know we he's sort of process of elimination, right? So he's like laws of inclination. There's no way that that could be that a moral action could be an action done from inclinations um, because it's based on something contingent. So we're not going to get guidance for a moral law um, from understanding our psychology or our, or sociology or stuff like that. Not, not all by itself. But maybe we can find it within these self-generated laws. Maybe, some, maybe there's a, a kind of maxim or principle that has objective and universal validity, that it's appropriate in all circumstances, um, and it could serve as a universal moral law. So there's still hope here. It may not be found, like I've been saying, like Kant's not presupposing anything, um, but that's where, we're, that's where the journey is going to take us next. We're going to be exploring what's going on here under self-generated laws and what are the options here, what could maybe theoretically serve as a moral law. I whipped that around really quickly because you weren't intended to read it, but just know that this is where the story is going. Um, the laws of inclination, that's a dead end, according to Kant. Okay. Um, final thing that is really important. I, I always like to make a big deal about this for Kant. So Kant's second proposition of morality is that whether an action is moral or not is going to come down to what were the reasons behind why someone did what they did. What were what rule or maxim were they following, and is that the right rule? So the next question is naturally going to be okay. If moral action, if the possibility of moral action depends on acting on self-generated laws, which ones, right? Acting on which rules are, what? which ones are going to constitute moral action? And Kant's got a lot of explaining yet to do. There's a huge part of the story that's happening from here on out. We're, we're only kind of the first third of the story right now uh, in terms of like taken logically. Uh, we've talked a lot more than, than a third here in setting things up. It'll start to fall into place a little quicker. But conceptually, that's about all that we've covered so far. Um, but even at this point, Kant's in a position to say something very, very interesting, um, something that I, I've um, marveled at uh, and been, been very influenced by in my own thinking about ethics. Kant says this, if whether or not you did an action depends on doing it for the right reasons, basically, having, uh, having your action determined by the proper objective, that you're aimed at the right goal, right? Aligning your will with what's necessarily good. Um, then you actually can never tell whether you acted in a way that had moral worth. If you acted on laws of inclination, if the only reason why you did what you did was because of feelings, uh, nature kind of programmed you to do this, then you can't really take any credit for that according to Kant. It doesn't have any moral worth. You're just a robot. You're just playing out your programming. There weren't any choices here. There's nothing... Um, where you sort of stepped in and, and made one thing happen as opposed to something else. Um, so there's nothing that's blamable or praiseworthy. You're, so it's not like you did something immoral. It's just, you, for, for Kant's perspective, you just did something amoral. It just kind of doesn't have positive moral worth to it. Um, we'll talk more about Kant and evil and what he thinks about the possibility of moral evil uh, way at the end of this story. But uh, to kind of foreshadow it a little bit, um, Kant's just sort of saying, like, you don't find morality in the world of inclinations and causal laws and people acting on that stuff. If you're going to find moral responsibility, it's going to happen somewhere on self-generated laws. But Kant says, I don't have knowledge about what determines my will. I don't have access to this. I can't see. Like, he thinks, um, the way Kant's kind of setting this up, his, his moral psychological view is that my will is sort of this, my will determines what action I perform. But my will is subject to the causal forces, these psychological, sociological laws of inclination, as well as answering to reason. Reason can kind of give rules to direct the will to do one thing rather than another. 
but in any particular action, I can't tell which is which. Theoretically, I can recognize that there's a big distinction here in how my will might be determined, but I can't ever tell in any particular action whether I did it out of respect for duty, whether I did it from a rule, a maxim, a law I gave to myself that was about what was good, and kind of like doing it for the sake of it being the right thing to do, or whether I did it for ulterior motives, some sort of psychological motive or desire or selfishness or something like that. Kant says, whenever we look into our hearts, everywhere we run into our dear self, which he's saying kind of sarcastically about the ego, that the ego is everywhere and, and kind of selfishness has his little tendrils into everything. Kant has a pretty pessimistic view. I mean, it might not look at it on paper, but he has a pretty pessimistic view of human nature. Um, but he do doesn't make him a pessimist. He's actually deeply optimistic about humanity, and, and we'll see how deep that goes as, as the story continues. But he, he he's, makes this really interesting claim about how you can't tell. You can't tell whether you did something that was morally worthy or not. You definitely can't tell with other people. You don't know why they're doing what they're doing. You don't know whether it's because of intentions, good intentions, or just causal laws, just playing out robotic causal programming. You can't tell, but you can't even tell with yourself. You might think, you're like, I formed an intention, I did this thing intentionally, but why did you form that intention? There is going to be a way that inclinations can co-opt the workings of reason, according to Kant. Um, so ultimately, it's really hard, it's impossible to tell. So this generates a really interesting result for Kant. It doesn't make his moral theory worthless. I don't think that that's true at all. Because even without being able to tell whether I did an action with moral worth or not, for Kant, I still know, or I potentially, you know, after the whole story comes out here, I could still be in a position to know theoretically what I ought to be doing. So I can recognize what morality demands of me, of what a moral action would look like theoretically, even if I can never detect whether it actually happened. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, this is a very awkward metaphor, so don't hold me accountable for this. And I actually know better about misusing um, this uh, for philosophical purposes, but I actually grind that axe quite a bit. Now this is almost kind of like uh, a quantum mechanics, quantum physics of morality, the way Kant's thinking about it. I know in principle what's going on, but any in any particular case, I can't get the complete picture. I can't see everything that's going on. Like in quantum physics, how I can't measure both uh, the spin, rotation, um, and uh, the position of an electron. Um, so anyway, don't worry about that metaphor if that doesn't make any sense. If you don't know about quantum physics, it's okay. Um, but the, the key point here is that for Kant, I may not be able to tell whether any of my actions, I can't keep moral score. Like, that that was a good action, or oh, I did a bad I did a bad thing. I can't ever really tell, um, but at least I know what morality would require. So I like to to this is a little bit of Tim Lineman philosophy here, but um, I like to relate this to two very different conceptual purposes that we use the word responsibility for. So I think this is what Kant's talking about is kind of intuitive. Uh, on the one hand, we uh, use the word responsible to talk about like who is responsible for that. Like something bad happens and we're like, who's to blame, right? Who are we going to hold accountable for doing the wrong thing? And that's the kind of thing that Kant says, can't really make judgments about that. Can't keep moral score. You never really know the moral worth of your actions. Um, you might make guesses, but you don't, you don't ever get to see that. You don't get to see the inner workings of your will and what determined it one way or the other, which thing won out when that action was performed. You can't tell. But we also use the, and I like to call that like a, a retroactive or retro-temporal sense of responsibility because it's like judging what happened in the past, right? And what happened, why did that happen? But there's another way in which we use the word responsibility. We also use it to talk uh, in a forward-looking way, like uh, f in the future, not the past, but in the future. Um, and to talk about taking responsibility. So if there's a scenario... Um, that I'm encountering, and I decide I'm going to do something about that, then I'm kind of like taking responsibility. I'm aiming at a goal. I'm like, I want to try to make that happen. Whether I actually will, whether I actually do accomplish that, I don't know going into it, but it's where my intention is set. And Kant's saying, 
that's where morality lives. And we can know what that requires. We can know what, potentially, what I should be doing without ever being able to tell whether I actually did it, whether I actually accomplished it. And I think that's really interesting. Some people might think, well, that's absurd. Of course we can make moral judgments of each other. We, and we can, don't we need to be able to hold people morally accountable? And I just... Just for me, just for Tim Lindemann's two cents on this whole shtick, this is actually one of the things that makes Kant's theory attractive to me. I think this is kind of how the moral landscape actually looks. I think if we think we can judge each other and ourselves morally, we're probably mistaken about that. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to think about what's morally right or that we could have knowledge about that. We can have knowledge about that. We can know about maybe what we should be doing, what we should be aiming at, even if we can't keep moral score. Um, this is kind of like the the whole like only jo God can judge kind of kind of sentiment here with morality. Um, only the shadow knows what lurks in men's hearts, kind of thing. Um, I I, I kind of think that that's right. That that seems realistic to our epistemic position, what we're in a position to be able to know about other people and ourselves. I don't think we have transparent access to our own inner mental states. But anyway. Uh, sorry for the extended tangent there, but I, I think that's just too important of a consequence or a feature of Kant's moral thinking to leave without comment. Um, if you have some questions about that, let me know. But I think that's going to be a kind of a big deal for Kant. Um, but anyway, going forward here, um, I think I'm, I'm actually going to, because with all the delays, it's getting really late here uh, for me recording this video. So I might stop this short of two hours. We're at an hour and 40 minutes in the video right now. So I might stop this and and uh, try to finish up Kant on Thursday. But just as a kind of a game plan here so you can know where things are headed. Where we're going from here is we want to think about, okay Kant, if you're right, you know, following the logic so far, that if an action is going to even potentially or theoretically have moral worth, um, here, let's zoom in here, that's going to have to do with uh, actions that are determined from self-generated laws, so the whole game of morality, moral action now depends on which rules, that's what we're going to look at next. And Kant's going to do a kind of logical analysis of this, of just what are the, the theoretical options for how we can give rules for our own conduct? How do we write our own programming? He's going to do another kind of process of elimination here. He's going to talk about hypothetical maxims and categorical maxims, and we'll talk about what these mean logically. Uh, and then eventually, we're going to get to Kant's answer to all of this, the categorical imperative. That's going to be Kant's master law. That's going to be his supreme principle of morality. And just as a little bit of foreshadowing here, so you can kind of know where this is going um, and know what to expect. What Kant's going to do is try to use pure logic, just pure logic, to uh, ground this core law of morality. And when you hear it, when I define the categorical imperative for you, you're going to be like, what? Or maybe you won't. I mean, I, who knows how you'll react. But you may be like, awesome. But you also might just, it might be kind of like a bad joke, like a groaner, or it feels like a loophole or something, where it's like, that's your moral law, Kant? It might, it's going to feel so thin and, like, trivial and it's like, how can you make a substantial moral perspective out of this? But that's exactly what Kant's going to try to do. And it's really interesting how he tries to pull a rabbit out of a hat here. Or, or my favorite metaphor is really Kant's taking, he's trying to s squeeze blood from a stone. Like he's got this stone of this just like bare logical law, this uh, logical observation really. And from that he's going to get this really rich moral theory that has all these obligations and invites all this kind of uh, deep way of thinking about the way in which we're related to each other as human beings. Um, and not even human beings, as people, like including non-human animals and sentient aliens and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, it's, it's really remarkable. You might not buy it, and we'll see. And I want you thinking critically about this. Um, you might not agree with how Kant's deriving everything, that he is licensed to everything he's going to say. But this is what he, he's trying to, at least as far as his theoretical intentions here as a philosopher, he is trying really hard to make sure that when he, pre, he grounds a moral theory, it's on solid footing, 
not based on any contingencies whatsoever. Absolutely necessary, unconditional, universal to everything, under all possible circumstances, every possible scenario for a person or a dilemma or a choice, that this law applies with validity to all of it. And all the rest of the juicy stuff that he wants to go from there all comes from just the force of that thin logical principle. So I think that's what we'll get into. I'm not going to try to open up a big can of worms here um, with the remaining time tonight. Um, I'm even feeling lightheaded like I'm going to pass out from maybe talking too much. Um, and it's getting late. But um, we'll finish this up on Thursday. Um, and probably, I, I was really hoping to get to Aristotle this week. Um, still may be possible, but... We might take all the time on Thursday's lecture for Kant too. Um, there's definitely a lot to chew on here, um, and and there's so much going on. I, I I don't want to overwhelm you too much. I, un, being overwhelmed is unavoidable here. That's just how it's going to go. It's a roller coaster. Um, but hopefully that th this is going well. And not having a lot of work for the class is giving you time to kind of process this stuff and think about it. Um, even though I'm not putting a lot of busy work and stuff on your plate. Um, please, please, please take the class seriously. Um, if you know the videos are really dense, pause them, rewind them, watch them again. Um, definitely, that's an option that you've got. You also definitely have the option of reaching out and talking to me, and I, I really would love to do that. I, I've had very little contact with students so far. Uh, I'm reading journals right now and getting on grading those, and I'm very excited to hear what you have to say in those. Um, but those are a little slower response time. Um, Talking on the phone, I can do that every day of the week um, through email, text messages. Uh, I would love to have more interactions with you and help you dig through this material. Um, definitely, like we talked about in the first video for the whole course, that online classes have, have that risk of kind of not putting as much into them um, or, or staying up on things and, and really digging into it as much. Uh, that's been my experience with it as a student and as an instructor. So... Um, I hope you can resist that when there's not something putting your feet to the fire um, other than just a desire to understand. Um, I think all these systems are going to be very relevant for tracking what's going on uh, with all the stuff with business ethics that we'll be getting to hopefully soon, as soon as we can. Um, but So I think this is time well spent, and I hope that you invest energy and effort into understanding it. And let me help you. I really want to help you with this. So, um, yeah, I think I've... Beat that horse dead enough. Uh, the code word for tonight, I just realized we need one. How about technical difficulties? That would be apt. So the code word for tonight is technical difficulties. Um, thanks for watching, and sorry again to everyone who tried to come up for the live chat. Silly that it happened on the, the one night that I wanted to try to make things a little easier for my schedule than circumstances. So... Um, I'll, I'll see what I can do to fix this and, and, and diagnose what happened. I think it was just a bad internet connection, something weird going on with my internet tonight. But my, my apologies. Um, I'm sorry for that. I know that's really frustrating. So it's frustrating to me, too. Um, all right. I'll see you all on Thursday. And, um, oh, definitely wanted to say this, too. With journals, I... Uh, would really like if in an ideal world I'd be writing feedback to every single person's journal. Um, that's something I desire to do as your instructor. Since I had a child uh, and that whole bandwidth thing is getting sucked up with that, uh, a lot of things that I've that I used to do as an instructor, I used to make that like a rule. I was like every week I'm going to give comments to every student's journal assignments because um, I'd like to be in communication with you. With my schedule, I know that sometimes I'm not going to be able to do that. My bandwidth is going to get sucked up. But I wanted to tell you this. First, I want to tell you what my intentions are. And I want to back that up with a commitment to you in action. So it's not just a sentiment of like, oh, I'd really like to do this, but sorry. But this is what I want to uh, promise and pledge to you. If I don't spontaneously give you feedback, which I definitely do that all the time, and I try to do it as much as I can, but if you get it graded, and there aren't any comments there in Canvas. And you're like, oh, man, I really wanted to get some feedback from Tim. Because I get feedback sometimes whether I know that a student wants it or not and just offer it for free. But if you really wanted it and you were sad to not see me give you any feedback um, or you had questions about it or anything like that, let me know. 
and I will put you on a priority list of like, I will make that happen. I will find a way to make it happen um, because my students really matter to me. Uh, you matter to me. And um, part of that, I think, is being there with you as a part of going on this journey um, and helping you think through stuff and being that kind of just just that kind of um, uh, mascot's not quite the right word, but um, partner on the journey kind of thing, walking on the hike with you, going up the mountain kind of thing. I think I, I need to be around. I need to be present. Kind of like, um, yeah, just like a fellow truth seeker alongside with you. So um, that's important to me, and I, I want to make time for that, especially if you uh, are looking for that kind of feedback, if you think that would be valuable to you. Um, if I know that it's not just me throwing my two cents in maybe where it's not even invited or welcome, um, if it is welcome, if you do invite it and you want it, then I'll definitely make it a priority. I'll find some way to make it work. So let me know. Let me know. Um, send me a text. That's always the best way. Text is the most direct, followed by phone call, of course. And then um, we, we talk through... Uh, Canvas a lot, the Canvas conversations inbox menu thing, like email system that it has in there. That's how most people have been contacting me. You're definitely free to uh, use um, my email that's on the syllabus as well, but um, let me know. Let me know if you want to talk more. I'm always down. Okay. I'll, I'll do as much of it as, as my life allows me to and my schedule and everything, of course, but um, definitely the willingness is there. Okay. Good luck. Uh, I hope you read some Kant. Definitely if you can check out the second section, I think it'll serve you well in following along with these lectures and supplementing that. And I'll see you on Thursday. Bye-bye.